and delivered by our very own Daniel Molina, who is past master of Hibiscus Lodge. And he is very well known in the state and out of the state as a brother who's very educated and has, has a really good gift of presenting these presentations to everyone. So without further ado, I will just give him the floor. Daniel, it is all yours. As I was telling a, a, a brother earlier, you know, please hold on the tomatoes. Don't throw uh, so many at me. At least I finish. First and foremost, I want to thank Eureka North Shore Lodge for allowing me to come here to uh, give a presentation. I know that we have been discussing for a while, um, a time for me to be able to come here and spend time uh, with my, my brothers, uh, friends, and guests uh, to be able to give a presentation. Um, and tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is a topic that has actually been uh, interesting me, it, it interesting me since I started in Freemasonry back in 2016. This is actually a presentation that I initially gave in 2017. Obviously, I have since added some more information to it. And what drew me to it is how insane, how bizarre this topic actually is. You're going to hear some of the wildest claims that were going on uh, at the time, uh, some accusations against uh, Freemasonry and some prominent Freemasons. Um, and unfortunately, even though it was debunked, by the individual that started it, who was a Freemason, by the way. It has had negative ripples that we are still dealing with to this day. So it's gonna be fun. You're gonna hear a lot of outlandish things, um, but we're gonna do a, a small little deep dive. Unfortunately, it's a little bit more uh, expansive than the information that I have presented, but I've tried to uh, make it as condensed as I possibly can. So without further ado, I present to you the Taxi of Oaks, a conspiracy against Freemasonry. <coughs> so before we start, some of the topics that we're going to be discussing today is I'm going to introduce you to three Masonic characters. Some were more involved uh, in the hoax, not directly, but they had some involvement with it uh, more than others. Those are Arthur Edward Waite. Brother Eliphas Le Levy, and also Brother Leo Taxil, the perpetrator of this hoax. We're going to discuss the life of Leo Taxil. I'm going to give you a, a primer on who this individual was. This Leo Taxil was not his name, it was a pseudonym. We're going to explore what the Taxil hoax was, some of the claims and the negative impact that it had on Freemasonry at the time. We're going to discuss Palladism and the Palladian Order. Now, what is Palladism and the Palladian Order? This is uh, the small little cabal that's at the top of Freemasonry. <laughs> and these are the ones that actually run everything around the world uh, when it comes to uh, Freemasonry. We're gonna discuss and introduce who Diana Vaughn was. So she was the great temple mistress of the Freemasons. We're gonna discuss April 19, 1897, and why it's an important date. And at the end, I'm just gonna have some concluding remarks and we're gonna leave it up to any questions and answers. So, who was Brother Arthur Edward Waite? So, Brother Arthur Edward Waite was born October 2nd, 1857, <coughs> Brooklyn, New York. It was on September 19, 1901, that he was initiated at Renamy Lodge number 2430 in Raysbury, in Buckinghamshire, England. Now, he got initiated, and the reason why he was so attracted to Freemasonry is because he wanted to explore some of the higher degrees, specifically in the York Rite. So it was on May 1st, 1902, that he was exalted to the degree of Holy Royal Arch. That same year, he also joined the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, uh, informally known as the Masonic Rosicrucians. As a writer, he wrote over 70 books, and he covered topics such as Rosicrucianism, 
Freemasonry and magic among others. Now, if you look at that card, uh, maybe some of you recognize it from the tarot deck, right? That some people might use. Well, this is the Rider Weight Rider because that was a company that published them. Uh, and under supervision of Arthur Edward Waite, Pamela Coleman Smith illustrated them. So yes, this is the brother Arthur Edward Waite that uh, gave us the, the, the Rider Waite Tarot. And the reason why I'm mentioning him is uh, because he wrote this book, Devil Worship in France. And there's another book called Diana Vaughn and the Question of Modern Paladism. Now, as the, the taxi hoax was going on, he was like, what is this? What's going on? I, I have to explore this. So he kind of did some journalism and he explored the taxi hoax as it was going on, questioning these claims and these accusations and trying to get down to, to the bottom of it. Later on, he wrote Diana Vaughn on the question of modern paladism after the taxi hoax had been debunked and he kind of went back to revisit the hoax and, and all of its contents. So if you're interested, you can read that. As I mentioned earlier, he's also written uh, about a number of other topics, so maybe if that interests you, I do have the books here so you can check them out. Next, we have Brother Eliphas Levy. Now, Brother Eliphas Levy was born Alphonse Louis Constant on February 8, 1810. He was initiated in the Lodge Rose du Parfait Silence, Grand Orient of France, on March 14, 1861. Aside from being a Freemason, he was also a ceremonial magician who wrote a number of books on topics including Freemasonry and the occult. And he also contributed innovations regarding the tarot as well. Now, I mention him because the image of the Baphomet is going to come later on, uh, which was very prominent in the works of Taxil that he was writing against Freemasonry. And this illustration specifically of the Baphomet is the one that Eliphas Levy had initially illustrated. So he kind of took it, was perversing it to, to fit it against the narrative that he was proposing against Freemasonry, but this is where the illustration first comes from, uh, Brother Levy. And then finally, who was Leo Taxil? So Brother Leo Taxil was born Marie-Joseph Gabriel Antoine Jogan Faget in Marseille, France in 1853. He attended Jesuit school while growing up and he would go on to pursue writing and journalism as a professional career. Now, aside from the pen name Taxil, he was also writing under various pseudonyms like Diana Vaughn, the great temple mistress that I had mentioned earlier. It was in 1867 that he borrowed a book on Freemasonry from a very close friend. But at the time, the church was vehemently anti-Masonic, so the book was confiscated. However, his interest in Freemasonry still persisted. So in 1881, Taxil was finally initiated in the Lodge Les Amis de la North France, Friends of French Honor. Uh, but he did not progress past the intern apprentice degree uh, because in August of that year, he was expelled for a literary theft and publishing uh, pornographic material, so kind of stories that were of a pornographic nature. He became disillusioned with religion and he dedicated himself to writing pornographic content and also writing anti-Catholic and anti-Masonic pieces. So these are some of his anti-clerical works. So we have The Secret Memoirs of Pius IX. We have The Amusing Bible for Grown-Ups and Children. And then he also wrote a text called The Life of Jesus. Uh, in both works, Taxil attempts to point out what he believes are inconsistencies, false beliefs, and errors that he found while digging through the Bible. And he generated further controversy by writing books that aimed at presenting leaders in the Catholic Church as degenerates, and he was likening them to Marquis de Sade. Now, if you're not familiar with Marquis de Sade, who was a French philosopher from the 1700s, wrote extensively on sex and philosophy, and it's from him that we get the, the, the word sadomasochism. So I'll leave it to your imagination to uh, think of, of what type of content he was writing. So on April 20th, 1884, uh, Pope Leo XIII issues the human genome. And in the encyclical, the Pope describes that there are two different and opposing parties in the world. There's one side that fights for truth and virtue, 
and there's the other side that fights for those things which are opposed to virtue and truth. So he was kind of talking about the Catholic Church and then Freemasonry as its opposing opposite. And the Pope writes that the one fights the other with different kinds of weapons and battles at all times, though not always with the same ardor and fury. In our days, however, those who follow the evil one seem to conspire and strive all together under the guidance and with the help of the society of men spread all over and sadly, solidly established, which they call the Freemasons. Taxil, upon reading this, had an idea and he said, I've been excommunicated from the church because of my anti-clerical work, but what if I fake converting to Catholicism again? I was already a Freemason, I know all the secrets, I can get work published and then I can play both sides. That's exactly what he did. He pretended conversion, he denounced his works, he was absolved by the Papal Nuncio in Paris from any and all excommunications that had been recorded against him, and he set out to uh, create this taxial hoax. Now, if you're interested in reading the letter, I do have a copy. The great thing about it is that illustrious Albert Pike actually wrote a response to it, so my copy has both, so if you're interested in reading it, I can definitely share that with you. So what was the taxio box? Here we have the, uh, the Baphomet figure that I was talking about earlier. So taxio worked on a four volume history of Freemasonry titled Complete Revelations of French Masonry. And it focused on alleged eyewitness accounts of Satanism that was going on in the fraternity. The first volume of the set was called the Three Point Brothers. And it argued that the true philosophy of Freemasonry was quote, nothing but gross pantheism to which the addict is gradually brought through a series of ridiculous masquerades, starting with the glorification of the material and ending with the adoration of Satan. Taxil describes accounts involving an incarnate demon that allegedly wrote a prophecy on Diana Vaughn's back with its tail, and that is said to have happened in a lodge. And one of the claims made by Taxil actually accused Freemasons of being murderers themselves. This is an excerpt of what an initiation is like. So Taxil writes that before a man is admitted to the higher degrees, he is blindfolded and taken into a room where a live sheep is lying on the floor. The animal's mouth and feet are secured and it is clean shaven so that its skin feels to the touch like that of a human being. Next to the animal, a man is placed who breathes heavily feigning to struggle against imaginary enemies. The candidate is given to understand that the sheep's body is that of a disloyal mason who gave away the secrets of the order and must die according to the ancient law, the candidate being made executioner as a warning to him. Then he is given a big knife and after some ceremonial is persuaded to kill the traitor, that is, plunge the knife repeatedly into the body of the sheep, which he imagines to be that of an unknown human being his brother. Thus, every mason is a murderer in spirit at least, if not actually, for sometimes treacherous masons take the place of the animal. So what was he essentially saying? You go in, you're killing a sheep, right? But sometimes if a mason kind of slacked, gave away some secrets, they replace it and you're also killing a, a, a mason. So it's either or, right? Now this is a copy of uh, propaganda that he was writing, The Mysteries of French Freemasonry. There you see the Baphomet figure with, a, with an apron. In 1891, one of his books was actually reissued uh, with the title, Are There Women in Freemasonry? And this is what gave birth to the conspiracy of the Palladian Order that I discussed earlier. In the initial publication, Taxil had dedicated some pages to the alleged Palladic Rite, explaining that the order had pretended to have been founded in 1637, but it was actually it actually dated back to May 20, 1737, as the Order of the Palladium, or the Sovereign Council of Wisdom, and the secret password is said to have been Megapen. This new Palladium, which was reformed from an older version that had fallen through, was dedicated to Luciferianism. They did not see Lucifer as an evil figure. 
and instead they, quote, consider him as the principle of good and the equal of the God of the Christians, called by them the principle of evil. Palladian masonry was an androgen, androgen group, so I accepted both men and women, within Freemasonry that was a governing body. Taxil described it as an involving itself in, quote, blasphemy, devil worship, and thinly veiled debauchery. In France, the secret organization is said to have had three different lodges, but the most important lodge was the Mother Lodge, called Lotus, which was named after the fruit Lotus Eaters, which makes one forget fatherland and religion. The lodge is said to have been established in the 1850s by Knights Kadosh, who were involved in black magic at the time. Also, Freemasons had these Masonic ninjas that were called the Rosy Serpents. And what they did, they were an elite core of pallid spies who infiltrated Catholic convents, right? So some undercover covert operatives. While the political center of the sect was located in Rome and it was facing the Vatican and the administrative directory could be found in Berlin in its supreme dogmatic directory had been established in Charleston, South Carolina which was called the Luciferian Rome. This is where the Baphomet of the Templars was said to be kept, and a sanctuary had been created around it. This is also where Lucifer is said to have appeared every Friday at three in order to give directions to the highest members of the Palladian Order. Taxil explained that illustrious Albert Pike argued that, quote, Freemasonry's mission was to combat wherever and however it could the temple of intolerance, that is, Roman Catholicism. Special instructions were given to the Palladium's political director at Rome to monitor the Vatican's activities and do all that it was in its power to undo them. In the human genus, one of the arguments that Pope Leo XIII uh, makes is that to become a Freemason, you actually have to renounce being a Catholic, so you can't be both. Because the Freemasons tell you that you have to renounce your, your faith. There was also a diabolical telephone that the Freemasons had that was used by demons that, was, that were enabled by illustrious Pike in order to keep in contact with supreme directors of high masonry across the world. So that's how all the masons were, you know, communicating with each other was through this telephone that had demons that were uh, sending secret messages. So Taxil further writes that the order engaged in orgiastic and blasphemous ceremonies at which demons appeared and miracles happened, and it sought to overthrow the Catholic Church and of the established social order at the time. In the Palladian order, there were two masculine grades and one feminine grade that were respectively titled Adelphes and Companion of Ulysses, and then the Companion of Penelope for Females. An illustrious Albert Pike was considered the head of the order, and his official title was the Pope of the Freemasons, or the Supreme Commander, Grand Master of the Supreme Council of the Mother Lodge of the Ancient and Accepted Scotch Rite of Charleston, which was the, the Luciferian Rome. And in the book, Children of Lucifer, which is a, a book that kind of does a, a deep dive on the history and development of Satanism, uh, there is an example of an alleged initiatic rite for females uh, within Freemasonry that's called the Trial of Lazarus. So when a female was initiated into Freemasonry, uh, the female postulate was led to a plateau called the Pastos, where a motionless, motionless male waited in a recumbent pose. You see before you a dead man, the initiatress explains. Eke homo. It is to you to transform him into a living God. With a huge depiction of Baphomet approvingly looking on and the congregation raising a general acclamation of Cain, Cain, the neophyte then was expected to bring the dead man back to life by performing the sexual act with him. After this part of the ritual, the aspirant Templar mistress was given a host that she had to pierce with a small ceremonial dagger to the cry, Nekom, Adonai, Nekom. Vengeance, Adonai, vengeance. Subsequently, a Luciferian prayer was offered and the Templar mistress was caught, was taught the duties of her new position, which could be sum summarized as execrating Jesus, 
insulting Adonai, adorating Lucifer. She then solemnly bowed herself to Lucifer, to you, genius of liberty, I swear to devote myself by all means at my disposal, whatever they may be, to the annihilation of political despotism and sacerdotal tyranny. And now, O Lucifer, I am your daughter forever. Now, Diana Vaughn is an important figure in the development of the Taxio hoax because she was known as the mistress of Freemasonry, so almost like the highest ranking female member within Freemasonry. And it's in a book titled The Devil in the 19th Century that Taxil introduces this figure, Diana Vaughn, who was a supposed descendant of a Thomas Vaughn, a Rosicrucian alchemist from the 1600s, who had allegedly made a pact with the devil, had received the philosopher's stone, and quote, was to be transported without dying into the eternal kingdom of Lucifer. Diana is described to have been introduced to Lucifer on April 8, 1889, and she had attained the title of Grand Mistress of the Temple and Grand Inspectress of the Palladium. She was said to have been betrothed to the demon Asmodeus, and she was described as having supernatural powers, like having the ability to liquefy herself, which is something that Freemasons were teaching in the lodges, you know, how to be able to liquefy yourself, go through walls and things like that. So, picture of Asmodeus. In the supposed presence of Albert Pike, Lucifer made her the Masonic High Priestess. She was called the Grand Priestess of the Masonic Order, but in 1895, she had a vision of Joan of Arc, and this vision called her to denounce her membership in Freemasonry, to flee, to go into hiding, and publish a memoir exposing the secrets of the Palladian Order, which ended up being her Confessions of an ex paladist that same year. Now, I do want to mention that aside from Diana Vaughn and Leo Taxil, there were also these other individuals that were publishing texts at the time. The texts were being given to Taxil. Taxil was giving them to the Catholic Church for distribution, but at no time did Catholic, the, the Catholic Church authorities ask to, to cl clarify or to see these individuals that were publishing these texts. So there was no confirmation that these individuals were even real. They were just accepting the text and then distributing. So this is Diana Vaughn describing an alleged Masonic black mass. In a thick cloud of perfumes, the priest ascends the altar of Satan's synagogue. On the table is seen a goat with a human face already excited by some preliminary homages, intoxicated by perfumes and adoration. The priest opens a box and takes out some wafers. The rites performed and the words spoken during the continuance of the magical ceremony are blasphemous in character. And the sacred vessel and its contents are subjected to insult and mockery. The goat plays the infernal part, cursing and reviving. And lastly, the following incantation is delivered. Master of these glanders, dispenser of the benefits of crime, intendant of sumptuous sins and great vices, sovereign of contempt, preserver of old hatreds and inspirer of vengeance and misdeeds. At this ceremony, the children of the choir are clad in red and wear scarlet caps surmounted by two horns. They hold black candles in their hands. Now, although authorities weren't asking to confirm who these individuals were, after some time, the public and the authorities wanted to know, well, you're giving us this information, but we want to hear from somebody else. So it was on this date, April 19, 1897, that Taxil said, you don't have to worry anymore. I am going to bring Diana Vaughn. We're going to hold a press conference. And in front of the world, Diana Vaughn is going to tell you exactly what is going on in these crazy Masonic lodges. So Taxil called a press conference at the Paris Geographical Hall to present Diana to the world. Instead, Taxil gave a discourse announcing that all his claims against Freemasonry were actually fictitious. The crowd largely gathered to hear more anti-Masonic rhetoric, was so angry at the revelation that Taxil was forced to duck out of a back exit of the building. Taxil was thankful to the Catholic press and bishops for the splendid help they had given him to organize the finest mystification of all, which was to crown his career. He further said that their cooperation was thanks to both ignorance and imbecility. 
It was important for him to make the announcement in April, which is the month of pranks, considering that his attack on Masonry had begun 12 years prior in April of 1885. However, even after his announcement, some people in the public said that his announcement was actually false. A writer for the Observatore Catalu in May of 1897 said that, quote, the Masons had held Taxil captive during the conference and that the man who took the platform was actually an imposter. And another account, account claimed that Diana failed to appear because the Masons had actually bribed Taxil to place her in an insane asylum before the conference. <coughs> now his comments in front of this public were later published by La Frondor, uh in an article called 12 Years Under the Banner of the Church, The Prank of Paladism, Miss Diana Vaughn, The Devil at the Freemasons, a conference held by M. Leo, Mr. Leo Texel at the Hall of the Geographic Society in Paris. And some of the comments that he made as to why he had created this elaborate hoax, he said, the public made me what I am, the arch liar of the period. For when I first commenced to write against the Masons, my object was amusement pure and simple. The crimes laid at their door were so grotesque, so impossible, so widely exaggerated. I thought everybody would see the joke and give me credit for originating a new line of humor. But my readers wouldn't have it so. They accepted my fables as gospel truth. And the more I lied for the purpose of showing that I lied, the more convinced became they that I was a paragon of veracity. Texel added that it dawned upon me that there was lots of money in being a Munchausen of the right kind. And for 12 years, I gave it to them hot and strong, but never too hot. When indicting such slush as the story of the devil snake who broke prophecies on Diana's back with the end of his tail, I sometimes said to myself, hold on, you're going too far. But I didn't. He concluded by saying, I spent with my fellow authors hatching out new plots, new unheard of perversions of truth and logic, each trying to outdo the other in organized mystification. I thought I would kill myself laughing at some of the things I proposed, but everything went. There is no limit to human stupidity. After the hoax, Taxio returned to his old ways. He was writing works on how he fooled the Catholic Church and expressing his anti-clerical views. And he was once again excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church, and he died in Sioux, France, on March 30th, 1907. Now to conclude, I make an effort in, these, in this presentation to highlight that Taxil was in fact a brother, and I call him brother throughout the presentation. Uh, because although this hoax has already been debunked, we're dealing with a lot of the repercussions to this day. A lot of us probably have heard this thing, oh, well you don't actually know what's going on because you're not, you're not really up there. You know, uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in, in 2020, I saw a lot of people sharing information saying that the Freemasons were the ones that had actually released the coronavirus uh, to, to, you know, to, to kill members of the public, right? And I think that we find ourselves in an interesting point in history when it comes to Freemasonry, uh, because as Freemasons, it's important for us to continue being as educated as we can possibly be. Uh, I think that for some time, maybe indirectly, you know, the profane has kind of defined who we are, and I think that it's our duty to take control of the narrative, you know, with the use of the internet and, and to combat misinformation for us to, to take control of the narrative and to uh, define ourselves. So that's why I conclude with the words of Right Reverend Benjamin Allen, who wrote, Remember then I beseech you that a single intemperate mason is enough to ruin in the eyes of many the character of the whole order. A single profane mason is enough to blast the reputation of our principles. Thank you so much for this.
out of, out of curiosity, you know the movie The Da Vinci Code? Yeah. You, you remember in the beginning when she was young and she peeped in the, in the window and she saw one of those uh, like sexual rituals and all that? Would, was that similar to uh, the one you mentioned? That um, it, it, it could be. You know, it, it could it, immediately what comes to mind is I don't know if anybody's seen that Stanley Kubrick movie, Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. So it's like a similar type of, you know, thing. You know, because it, it was basically um, one of the, the most outlandish things that we can we can talk about just to uh, fan the flames, you know, of, of the anti-Masonic fervor. You know, so it got to a point where it didn't matter what any of those individuals were saying. There was another, you know, Dr. Bataille, Diana Vaughn, Leo Taxil. You know, it didn't matter what any of them were saying. People weren't going to question it because there was already that anti-Masonic rhetoric that was, you know, that was growing at the time. So... You know, maybe. Dan, I just want to say, I've been a mason for 40 years. Nothing is further from the truth than what the Leo Jackson is saying. Masonry, to me, has, I've never seen a woman during a state meeting. I've never seen people being cut up on animals. This is totally blasphemous, in my opinion. I'm sorry, I disagree with, or maybe Leo Jackson. But to me, Masonry has the best thing happened to me. Well, I, I think and we'll I'll disagree with what we I'll tell you why. I'm finished. Sorry. Um, masonry has brought, I've learned a lot in Masonry. It's improved my memory. It's improved the way I relate to other people. And I think I have grown out of being a, a young man to, uh, I, I hope, a more interesting person. And I do, that's not the only thing I do with Mason, I do other things. But to me, I found Mason a great thing. And I, when I hear people like that running down Mason, they always have to find the scapegoat. Whether it was the Masons, whether it was the Jews, whether it was the uh, uh, Catholics, whether it was the Protestants, There's somebody's gonna be a scapegoat. And I think this guy trying to say that Masonry is, is wrong. And all he did was just an EA. The beauty of Masonry is much more, as you know, much more degrees. Yeah, so, so remember, he, he was, you know, he was making these false claims, you know, because he, he kind of wanted to fan the flames, you know, and he, he kind of wanted to one up the Catholic Church at the time. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure every Mason in here agrees with you. You know, I, I agree with you too. You know, this is, this is crazy to, to read these things. Yeah. Well, Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, I think um, every Mason would absolutely agree that a lot of, despite some of this sounding pretty interesting and maybe borderline awesome, it's not the truth, uh, but it's amazing how, how uh, such an original troll move from way back then still has its repercussions today. And it's amazing how so many people just bought it, hook, line, and sinker. In fact, I think an interesting area of study would probably be also in American history when we have the anti-Masonic party here and even in contemporary times today where still to this day you have uh, I saw it um, personally with people that I know uh, certain very ignorant individuals blaming Masons for the recent school shootings for instance uh, that's been going around other ridiculous things have been going around too but uh, no thank you for that it's very informative and yeah, and, and immediately you hear about that, you know, the, the Palladian Order, you know, was the one that was running the shops uh, with Freemasonry around the world, and then that's where you kind of get the idea of, well, you, you got to be in the inner circle to, you know, to know what's really going on in Freemasonry, that's, you know? Even to this day, you know, people like Alex Jones says things like that also, right. specifically, right? as mm -hmm. far as modern. Yeah. So, I have a question. Um, actually, the Masonic question is related to why Catholic Church is actually against Freemasonry because when you look at any Wikipedia pages it's just because Masonry also you know kind of like disregard different religions and it's more neutralizing the religions more theists you know mm -hmm. the understanding of God and everything so and their rituals are not you know um, but do you think that is there um, any political reasons behind it because when I'm looking at the dates that you're talking about the box these are also the dates that's the dates in France that um, Freemasonry has like you know some 
semi-official recognition by Napoleon, and then similar time after the Civil War, flourishing of fraternity in the U.S. And then in France, if I'm not wrong, that Freemasonry also has some sort of ties with radical parties, and there's also some like, then the conspiracy started with that also Freemasonry is run the government right. and stuff right. like that. So maybe it's not purely uh, religious, um, you know, opposition to right. Freemasonry, but also political. Yeah, uh, in in the um, obviously I didn't I didn't do a, a deep dive in the in the encyclical, but in in the um, in Human and Genus, Pope Leo the Thirteenth goes into how these individuals are meeting in secret and nobody really regulates them. Nobody knows what they're doing in, in the lodges, you know. So there's there's almost this um, this this fear of you know are these individuals trying to take take over us, you know, and trying to to take you know any control that that we might have, you know. So he, he does go go into that. Yeah, because I if. Again, I'm not wrong. The the Grand Orient, the friends, right. which is also uh, coincidentally the lodge of the founder of Turkey, Ataturk, mm -hmm. and it also, if, again, if I'm not wrong, from that lodge there were some um, conspiracies, not only that hawks, but like more political conspiracies that they are actually the uh, Freemasons were collecting information about certain people. Uh, again, like for political purposes and stuff. So yeah, to, to my knowledge, and I, and I might be uh, wrong, uh, but if I'm not mistaken, I think the Grand Orient of France is, is is different because a lot of them, you know, kind of get into politics and they endorse politicians and they, you know, you know, they, they have kind of different. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that, that they're not they're not rec recognized. So it's you know the, the Grand Orient of France is is definitely different in that case. That's true to this day. If I'm not mistaken, somebody can yeah. fact check me, but if I recall correctly, there's two in France. One of them. Yes, like, there are. It was uh, Max. When Max went and he had the photo, everything, because they're not recognized. Ooh, he's in trouble. After the hoax, how long it was to like, make peace in the church? <laughs> In, t in terms of what Freemasonry and, and th there hasn't been, I, it continues to this day. Yeah, it, it continues to this day. There's no, there's no, yeah. I mean, we have, we have, we have, we do, we do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's peace between both parties. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and, and and kind of the same sentiment extends to other, you know, Greek Orthodox, and you know, they also have very. There's a lot of tension between Freemasonry and them, so you know that that that, that also extends to other uh, other faiths as well. Yeah. All his books were released in France, right? Right. Um, I find it funny that you picked on Albert Pike in Charleston as the epicenter for the uh, Right. It was nowhere else but in Charleston. That was the original uh, headquarters of the Scottish mm -hmm. Rite. Oh, was it? Before yeah. they moved to, to Washington for the Southerners to. That, my English. Wow. The, must be the fish and chips. Uh, <laughs> the, the Southern jurisdiction was originally in Charleston, um, but later. They moved up. Yes. Yeah. Well, once again, I want to thank Eureka North Shore for allowing me to come here and present this uh, absurdly crazy uh, <laughs> presentation. But you know, as as we know, you know, even though all of this has been debunked and none of this is true, none of this has anything to do with Freemasonry. Uh, it never has and it never will. Unfortunately, we still see the the ripples that are, are still affecting us to this day. Sorry. One more really quick thing. Uh, Taxil was. Just an entered apprentice? Yeah. Just like, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, Eliphas Levy was also just an, an entered apprentice as well. So where do they get their credibility from then? Well, nobody was, uh, nobody was questioning it. Just, you know, he just said, I'm a Freemason, I got the secrets, I know everything, and it's like, let's go. All right, <laughs> you know? So, and, and, and that's kind of, you know, that, that's, that's what I had commented on before that, you know, Diana Vaughn, Dr. Bataille, all of these other individuals were saying, well, you know, I've seen these degrees, I've, I know this, I know what the Freemasons are doing, and they were getting the text, and nobody was tr trying to fact check, you know, okay, well, let's meet Dr. Bataille, have him come, come in here, let's meet with Diana Vaughn, you know, until it got to a point where it was like, all right, well, 
let's have Diana Vaughn speak, and then you know you get him coming out and saying I'm a troll. You know, <laughs> it's like, essentially, you know, I'm a troll. I lied to you all. You know, that's all I've got. Twelve years to kind of yeah. develop. Oh, years, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Facebook was the first. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a dedicated show. Uh, he was the one who created this name of Gold in the history. He was the one who sort of disseminated that. About the what? Gold. Of the gold. Of the somebody before. <coughs> yes. No. Yes. Yes. You yes. Know, yes. Because he had uh, taken the the illustration. Uh, that a lifeless levy had made for for his book, the the, high, uh, the doctrine of high magic, I think, um, and then kind of just slapped it onto to Freemasonry, and you know went went from there. You know, and he kind of goes into the um, uh, th this is something I didn't, I didn't uh, cover, but also if if you're familiar with Templar history, you know that the, the Templars were persecuted, and then one of the accusa accusations that were uh, thrown at them was that they were you know. Um, uh, kind of worshiping the Baphomet and you know, so he was trying to bring in all and and to be honest that that's one thing that I think that we're dealing with today where you have these Small conspiracies and then there's an amalgamation where there's like a big one You know and that, that's kind of what he was you know what he was getting at you know taking a little bit over here a little bit over there a little bit over here and then You know the four volume set of the revelations of Freemasonry, you know, so. And you were selling the phones too, or no? well, how can we get the phones? Oh no, the phones, if you're not, if you don't know about the phones, you're not high up. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be right. You gotta, you gotta go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> were you gonna say something? <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you for allowing me to come here and uh, speak. I always have a, a pleasure visiting. Lodges, getting uh, spending time with my brothers and family and friends. Um, just some final. Well, if you want to reach out to me, uh, you know, send me any uh, questions. You want to talk, direct any hate mail. You can do that through there. Um, I do also want to talk about some announcements. So um, I have had the pleasure of working with the Southern California Research Lodge now for two years. Last year, I was able to be the guest editor of the of the June issue that covered Stoicism and Freemasonry. You can find some of my writing there. Um, this year, I was able to be the guest editor of the Taxio Hoax. So some of my published work is there as well. Other brothers contribute to it. Um, as well, and because I was able to guest edit their issue last year, I've also been invited to South Southern Pasadena Lodge, South Pasadena Lodge, I'm sorry, in California. So I'll be speaking October 3rd, 2022 on Stoicism and Freemasonry. So if you know any brothers or anybody over there that would be interested in, in going to see me uh, speak, then you can uh, let them know about that. And I'm very happy to uh, be able to represent Florida in California. So thank you so much.